All right, family. Now we're in part two. Dealing with the truth about the income tax. Let's just recap from the previous paragraph, shall we? Talking about federal employees. It says, please note that only people who are subject to this duty by clear statutory language are federal employees. The effect of Section 86 identifies what is really is a kickback of the part of the property agreed under employment contract to be paid for the labor of the federal government employee. By this act, the amount of compensation contractually agreed to was unilaterally diminished by one party to the agreement, which was Congress, without the consent of the other party, the federal employee. A unilateral change in the employment contract of all persons already in the employ of the federal government was and is not legal, and the conduct of the United States judges for the next 70 years proves it, as they refused to pay this duty until after 1932, of course. Thus becoming, according to the IRS, the very first tax protesters in American history. The judges understood that the result of arranging for the withholding of a 3% um, of compensation tax was due to federal government employees under the existing contracts and was a deprivation of property and liberty without due process of the law, which was volatile to the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. That's the recap. Part 2. The truth about the income taxes. The judges refuse. In 1863, Supreme Court Justice Tinney sent a letter to the Secretary of Treasury attacking implementation of Section 86 on the compensation of federal judges as being unconstitutional. This letter was also published as a Supreme Court decision under 157 United States Statute 701. In it, Justice Tenney states, The act in question, as you interpret it, diminishes the compensation of every judge 3%. And if it can be diminished to that extent by the name of a tax, it may in the same way be reduced from time to time at the pleasure of the legislator. Here you can see that the judges understood the effect of this law, which which was a diminishment by the name of a tax. They knew it was not actually a tax, but a forced debt obligation. In this country, there exists no circumstances on which a person lawfully can be forced to accept the debt against their will. They, the, I mean, the judges chose to exercise their right to refuse to accept this debt. The facts presented above were expressed by the Supreme Court in the Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Tax Company case in 1895. This is what they said. Subsequently, in 1869, the question arose whether the law which imposes such a tax upon them was constitutional. The opinion of the Attorney General thereon was requested by the Secretary of Treasury. The Attorney General, in reply, gave an elaborate opinion advising the Secretary of Treasury that no income tax can be lawfully assessed and collected upon the salaries of those officers who were in office at the time the statute imposing the law was passed. Holding on this subject, the views expressed by Chief Justice Tenney, his opinion is published in volume 13 of the opinion of the Attorney General, and you can find it on page 161. I am informed that it has been followed ever since without question by the department supervising or directing in the collections of public revenue. See, the kickback program illegally forced a 3% debt obligation upon federal government employees working under existing employment agreement of 1862. However, the kickback program established by Section 86 was legal when implied to the salaries of persons who took employment with the federal government after the act was passed because there was a, they, they were 
they were on notice that a 3% kickback was part of their employment agreement. This tax. Notice that it is not even called a tax in the act, but a duty. See, this duty only applies to federal employees. It is these two acts from the 1860s, the Foreign Income Duty and the Federal Employment Agreement Kickback, blurred under the 16th Amendment distractions whose provisions have been intentionally mingled by the IRS with the Social Security provisions of the 1930s that have become today's so-called income tax. It's not by proper changes of law, but by improper enforcement procedures by a renegade IRS, brutally and illegally intimidating, coercing, prosecuting good American citizens by threat in order to force them to pay a so-called income tax that they legally never owed in the first place, as you will see, because there they were never subject to the the subject to it under the law because they never worked for the federal government or earned a foreign income under treaty. A note from the commissioner. If we look at what the IRS tells us today about the income taxes in the, on the first page of Form 1040 under the tax instruction booklet from 1994, we find a note from the commissioner which is usually one of the first things in the booklet. This one is from Margaret Richardson, the current commissioner of the IRS. It states in part, Dear taxpayer, thank you for making this nation's tax system the most effective system of voluntary compliance in the world. The key to maintaining that system is assuring that you are treated fairly and equitably that your provisions, that your privacy is protected, and that our tax system is as simple and understanding as possible. Margaret Miller, Milliner Richardson. There it is. Voluntary compliance. Why does she say that? What does that mean? Does that seem strange to you, given the IRS known position in court? And how does it affect you, a sovereign American citizen, if compliance really is voluntary? We will come back to those questions in a bit, but I would point out here that the opening statement is not unusual. Nearly every instruction booklet from past years have opened up with some variation of this statement from the commissioner. The next thing we're going to take a look at is the Privacy Act and the Paperwork Reduction Act notice of 609. In other words, they send you that notice 609, which is required by law to be supplied to you by the IRS with any correspondence you receive from the IRS. It states in a pertinent part, hmm, Privacy Act, Paperwork Reduction Act, notice of 609. The Privacy Act of 1974 and the Paperwork Reduction Act of 1980 says that when we ask you for information, we must first tell you our legal right to ask for the information, why we are asking for it, and how it will be used. We must also tell you what could happen if we do not receive it and whether your response is voluntary, required to obtain a benefit or a mandatory under law. This notice applies to all papers you file with us, including this tax return. It also applies to any questions we need to ask you so we can complete, correct, and process your returns, figure your tax, and collect tax, interest, or penalties. Our legal right to ask for information is Internal Revenue Code Section 6001, 6011, 6012, subsection A, and their regulations. They say that you must file a return or statement with us for any tax you are liable for. Your response is mandatory under these sections. We ask for tax return information to carry out the tax laws of the United States. We need it to figure and correct the right amount of tax. If you do not file a return, 
do not provide information we ask for or provide fraudulent information, the law says that you may be charged penalties and in certain cases, you may be subject to criminal prosecution. Please keep this notice with your records. It may help you if we ask for another, ask for other information. If you have questions about the rules for filing and giving information, please call or visit any Internal Revenue Service office. In the third paragraph, it states, Our legal right to ask for information is Internal Revenue Code Section 6001, 6011, and 6012, subsection A, and their regulations. They say that you must file a return or statement with us for any tax you're liable for. Now, does that say you have to file a return for taxes that you're not liable for? No. Does it state who is liable? No. Does it even state what liability is? No. And that raises legal questions like what is liability and who is liable? We'll come back to those questions. Now keep in mind that this does not actually say that there is a right, that that there is, that that this is their right to ask you. Let me back up. Now keep in mind that this does not actually say that this is their right to ask you, the citizen, for any information. It doesn't actually specifically say from whom information may be requested. It just established that the legal right to request information does exist. But from whom may information actually be requested under these laws? Well, they cite three code sections in this notice. What does those sections say? Well, 6001, which is entitled Notice and Regulations Requiring Record Statements and Special Returns, says every person liable for any tax imposed by this title or for the collections thereof shall keep such records, render such statements, make such returns, and comply with such rules and regulations that the Secretary may from time to time prescribe. Whenever in the judgment of the Secretary it is necessary, he may require any person by notice served upon such persons and by regulations to make such returns, render such statements, and keep such records as the Secretary deems sufficient to show whether or not such persons is liable for tax. The only records which the employer shall be required to keep under this section in connection with, with charge tips shall be charge receipts. Records necessary to comply with section 6053 subsection C and copies of statements furnished by employees under sub, other section 6053 subsection A. Notice that the first three words of this code are every person liable. Does this code section actually establish liability or does it simply list the consequences of being liable, leaving the reader to assume that he or she is in fact liable elsewhere in the code? Indeed, it does not establish liability. It just merely lists consequences of being liable. It is interesting to note that the second sentence here says, whenever in judgment of secretary, Whenever in judgment of the secretary, it is necessary he may require any person by notice served upon such person by regulations to make such returns, render such statements, and keep such records as the secretary deems sufficient to show whether or not such persons is liable for tax. Have you ever noticed, have you ever received a notice from the commissioner? Like, have you ever received a notice from the tax commissioner. Are you sure that you're required to make such returns, render such statements, or keep such records? Which records, which statements, and which returns are, re are required? Do you see in the third sentence where it refers to employers? Does this code section apply to employers? Are employers liable for the tax? Well, if you want to know the answer to that, just go to section 3403 under the liability for tax. Well, let's now go to section 611. That was the next section that they cited in the notice 609 by the IRS as their right to request information. <laughs> 
Well, it says, under subsection 6011, general requirements of return statements or list. See, the general rule under section A, it says, when required by regulation prescribed by the secretary, any person made liable for any tax imposed by this title or with the respect to the collections thereof shall make a return or statement according to the forms of regulations prescribed by the secretary. Every person required to make a return or statement shall include therein the information required by such forms of regulations. See, the first statement states in a pertinent part. It says any person is made liable. Does this code section actually make anybody liable? Or again, does it just list the consequences being made liable leaving the reader to assume and, pers- and presume again that liability exists or it actually established elsewhere in the code. Neither of these code sections 6001 nor 6011 actually establish liability. They simply establish the consequences of being liable or being made liable. So we're going to look at for look for code sections that do state some persons is liable or is made liable for the payment of income tax that would trigger the filing requirements established by these sections. See, the last section referred to by the IRS on the Notice 609 as their right to ask for information under Section 6012, and it states in the pertinent part, Section 6012, persons required to make returns of income. Well, under the General Rule Section A, returns with respect to income taxes under subtitle A shall be made by the following. 1A. Every individual having a taxable year gross income which equals or exceeds the exemption amount except that a return shall not be required of an individual. I. Who, you know, this person who is not married, is not a surviving spouse, is not head of household, for a taxable year, his gross income is less than the sum of the exemption amount plus the basic standard deduction applicable to such individuals. You have two who household and for taxable year has gross income of less than the sum of the exemption amount plus the basic standard deduction applicable to such individuals. Three, who is the surviving spouse for the taxable year has gross income of less than the sum exemption amount plus the basic standard deduction applicable to sub to, to such individual. Four, who's entitled to make joint returns whose gross income when combined with the gross income of his spouse is for the taxable year less than the sum twice the exemption amount plus the basic standard deduction applicable to the to such a joint return but only if such individual and his, and his spouse at the close of the taxable year had the same household as their home this section states returns with respect to income taxes under subtitle a and subsection 1a says every individual having a taxable year so the requirement identified here is being established for individuals under subtitle a but where is the tax imposed on individuals that would correspond to this filing requirement and what is the exact legal nature of the specific requirements that is established by this section 6012 in conjunction with the opposing statute. The code section 6012 may appear to be related to individuals and corresponding filing requirements for returns, but what are its legal limitations as recorded in the law? And who are the individuals subject under subtitle A? Well, let's look at the structural organization of title. First, a short explanation regarding the organization of tax laws of the United States Code is necessary. The tax law of the United States of America is in Title 26 of the United States Code, the Internal Revenue Code. Tax 26 is broken into a number of subtitles, each subtitle being a distinct and separate section of the law, as the title below shows. Now, when you look through this title, I'm just going to read it to you so you kind of get it in your head. Dealing with income taxes, that's subtitle A, and that can be found in chapter 1 to chapter 6 under section 1. Next, you have estate and gift taxes. That's under subtitle B, 
found in chapters 11 to chapter 13, and that's in section 2001. Then you have income taxes, which is under subtitle C in chapters 21 to 25, and they could be found in sections 3101. Then you have miscellaneous excesses, and that's in subtitle B, chapter 31 to 47, under section 4041. Then you have alcohol. Let's back up. What is all covered under miscellaneous excises? Well, that's alcohol, tobacco, and certain other excises. And see, that falls up under section E. So let's so we're clear. Subtitle D deals with miscellaneous excises. And then subtitle E deals with alcohol, tobacco, and certain other excises. That can be found in chapter 51 to 54 under section 5001. Then you got procedures and administration. That's subtitle F. That's in chapter 61 to 80, uh, section 6001. Remember the 6001 to keep talking about? That's procedures and administration. Then you got joint committee on taxation. That's in subtitle G. That's in chapter 91 to 92 under section 8001. Then you got financing presidential election campaigns. That's under subtitle H. That's under chapter 95 to 96 under 9001 section. And then you have the trust fund code, which is under subtitle 1, chapter 98, dealing with sections 9500. This book examines the laws under substandards. You know, they were talking about this book examines the laws under subtitle A, income taxes, subtitle C, employment taxes, and subtitle F, procedures and administrations, which applies and implements the other subtitles under the law. The code sections we just looked at, 6001, 6011, and 6012, are all from subtitle F. Income taxes are in subtitle A, consisting of chapters 1 through 6 of title 26. Employment taxes are subject to subtitle C, consisting of chapters 21 through 25. It is important to understand that each subtitle establishes a distinct and separate program or tax with its own individual authority to administer within that subtitle over its code section. These authorities do not automatically cross over into other subtitles and cannot be invoked as an authority in any other subtitles unless it is shown as applicable within the law or provisions of regulations. Each subtitle imposes its own tax and establishes the groups of persons subject to that tax within the specific subtitle. Just because one group of people is subject to one tax under a subtitle does not necessarily imply that the group is automatically also subject to the taxes imposed by the other subtitles. To demonstrate this point, one could ask, do you pay subtitle E taxes? For most people, the answer is a resounding no. Why not? You may ask, isn't everyone subject to the law? The answer, of course, is that the group of persons subject to subtitle E taxes are only those people who are engaged into the manufacture of the sale of alcohol and tobacco products as prescribed in subtitle E. And as you will see, the group of people who are subject to section C, the employment tax laws, are those people who have voluntarily chose to participate in the social security program and supply a social security number, who then is subject to subtitle A, the income tax laws, and what exactly is the true nature of this tax and it is associating filing requirements. Well, section 6012 says, with respect to the income taxes under subtitle A, and we are looking for the code section where the income tax is imposed on individuals. So we go to Title 26, Subtitle A, Chapter 1, Section 1. This is what it says. Subtitle A, Income Taxes, Chapter 1, Under Normal Taxes and Sur Taxes. Subchapter A, Determination of Tax Liability, Under Part 1, Tax on Individuals. 
Well, in subsection 1, tax and post, it says <clears throat> married individuals filing joint returns of surviving spouses. There is hereby imposed on the taxable income of every married individual as defined under section 7703 who makes a single return jointly with his spouse under section 6013 and every surviving spouse as defined under section 2 subsection a a tax determined in accordance with with the following table now it states if if taxable income is not 32,450 over 32,450 but not over 78,400 and over 78,400 the tax is 15% of the taxable income it is $4,867 plus 50 cent plus 28 cent of the excess over 32,450 $17,733.50 plus 31% of the excess over 78,400. It also talks about head of household. There is hereby imposed on the taxable income of every head of household as defined in section 2B and as determined in accordance with the following table. It states, if the taxable income is not over $26,050, over $26,050, but not over 67,200, and over 67,200 the tax is 15% of the taxable income 39 I mean $3,907.50 plus 28% of the excess over 26,500 15,429,000 plus $50 I mean, I mean 50 cent plus 31% of the excess over $67,200 then it goes to unmarried individuals other than the surviving spouse and head of households. There is hereby imposed on the taxable income of every individual other than the surviving spouse as defined as section 2, subsection A of head of household as defined in subsection B, who is not married individuals as defined in section 7, 7, 7703, a tax determined in accordance with the following table. And it goes into if the taxable income is 19,450 over 19,450, but not over 47,050, over 47,050, the tax is 15% of taxable income. Um, the tax is $2,917.50 plus 28% of the excess over 19450 And the tax is $10,645.50 plus 31% in excess of 47450 Then you get to married individuals filing separate returns. There is hereby imposed on the taxable income of every married individual as defined in Section 7. 703 who does not make a single return jointly with his wife under section 6013 tax determined in accordance with the following table if the income is not over 16,225 over 16,225 but not over 39,200 over 39 1200 the tax is 15 percent of the taxable income the tax is two thousand four hundred and thirty three dollars and seventy five cents plus twenty eight percent of the excess of sixteen thousand two hundred and twenty five dollars the tax is eight thousand eight hundred and sixty six dollars and seventy five cents plus thirty one percent of the excess over thirty nine thousand under you know thirty nine thousand of two you know thirty nine thousand two hundred then you have estate and trust there is hereby imposed on a taxable income of estates and trusts. One, every estate and every trust taxable under this subsection, a tax deferred, a tax determined in accordance with the following table. If taxable income not over three thousand three hundred dollars, over three hundred, over three thousand three hundred dollars, but not over nine thousand nine hundred. And over 9,900, the tax is 15% of the taxable income. It is $495 plus 
28% of the excess tax of $3,300. And the tax, if it's over $9,900, is $2,343 plus 31%.